welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I am going to review the Artillery Sidewinder X2. This printer is packed with a lot of features and includes all the features you can expect from a new generation 3D printer, such as auto bed leveling, a direct drive extruder, a dual Z axis with a timing belt, a 32-bit board, silent stepper drivers, a micro SD card and USB drive support, a color touchscreen, and a high flow rate Volcano hot end. Besides all these features, it also comes with an AC heated bed. Generally, I would never use a large printer to print filament like ABS that requires 110 degrees Celsius heated bed temperature. For a large print bed, it will take forever to reach that temperature. But with this AC heated bed, it should take just around 3 minutes, which is awesome. The price of this printer is around $400. It seems the features and price are hard to beat, at least on paper. I would like to thank geekbuying.com for sending me this printer to review. Let's start with unboxing this machine. The assembly of this printer should be very simple. We have the base, the gantry, a filament holder, a power cord, and a tool bag. First, we will connect the gantry to the base, and you don't have to find the right screws from the bag as they already are placed underneath the base. So, we can just put the gantry on top of the base. There is a connector at the left side of the gantry. Make sure it's aligned and fully inserted to the base. Then, I will move it to the side of the table and tighten the screws. Rotate it and do the same to the other side. Okay, we can now put the filament holder together and put it on top and use the thumb screw to secure it. After that, we can connect the cables, starting with the filament sensor. Cut off the zip ties on the gantry and connect the Z-stepper motor on the right side. There is an unused connector and it was supposed to be for a Z-limit switch. But since we have a bed leveling sensor, the Z limit switch is no longer required. Then, connect the left Z stepper motor, followed by the filament sensor extension cable. That's all you need to do. We can now remove the tape and the protector on the heated bed, as well as the one on the touchscreen. Since I'm in the US and the printer is set to 115 volts, let's connect the power cord and turn on the printer. The menu is quite simple. We will start with Auto Home, go to Tools, Home, and Home All Axes. The homing speed is set quite fast. This is the real-time speed, and you can see the axes move much faster than a standard 3D printer. The Z axis also moves down much faster than I expected. I'm not sure if this will affect the accuracy of the bed leveling sensor, but we will do some tests and find out later. Then. I will manually level the four corners of the bed. And let's start with the first corner. It's doing auto home again. After that, it moves to the first corner so I can use the simple paper test and move the knob underneath to adjust the distance to make the nozzle slightly scratch against the paper. Do the same to all corners and be sure to get the same drag feel with the paper. Finally, go to the center of the bed. The distance is a little closer compared to the corners, but there is not much I can do with the center, so I'll just let the bed leveling sensor do its job. Next, go to More, select Z equals 0, and the nozzle will move to the preset 0 position. Move it up and down to set the distance to get the same slight drag feel with the paper, and press Save to EEPROM. I will press Z equals 0 to make sure the Z offset value is saved. It seems fine, and we can start auto bed leveling. Since this print has the homing and probing speed faster than other printers, I will do a simple test to see what level of accuracy this bed leveling sensor can achieve. I will connect the printer to the computer using the USB cable and use printer face to collect a few rounds of probe data. Then, paste it to a text editor, format the text, save it as a CSV file, and open it in the spreadsheet to do some calculations. I will calculate the standard deviation of all 25 points. We come up with an average accuracy of 0.014 millimeters, which is not bad. In terms of a 0.2 millimeter first layer, it's around 7%. 
so the sensor is not the most accurate one I have ever tested, but it's definitely not the worst, so it should be good enough. I'm going to start some test prints. Let's see what's inside the USB drive that came with the printer. I will start with this cube G-code file using some red PLA filament and see how it works. As you can see, there is some black filament inside the nozzle, which means they have tested the printer before shipping. It's not the standard calibration cube I expected. It's a simple round cornered cube with their artillery logo on top. It came out quite nice, the layers are looking good, and so everything should be working fine. Next, I will set up this printer in my own slicer starting with Cura. Add a printer and select Artillery. We don't have Sidewinder X2 here, but the profile for X1 should work the same, and just change the name to X2. Just using default settings should be fine. Let's slice a 3D Benchy with a default 0.2mm profile without making any changes and see how it prints. The Benchy came out very nice. No stringing at all, no layer bending issue, and the overhanging and cooling all look good. The text at the bottom is clear, and this kind of coated glass bed sticks very well. After that, I will try to print with PETG, and I will use Prusa PETG filament. Set the nozzle temperature to 235 and the bed temperature to 85, but leave all other settings unchanged. Let's print a set of standing tools. This print requires a higher accuracy as we need to screw the thumb screw inside to connect the parts. It will take 2 hours and 4 minutes with a default 20% in fill. I am a little worried that the screw is going to break, so I will try to increase the infill to 50%. The print time has no big difference. If I use 100% infill, it will take 20 minutes more. But I think I will just go with 100% infill to make sure they are durable, as I may apply some force when sanding them. The parts look beautiful. The screw can fit with a little bit of force, and it's totally usable. Since this printer is using an AC heated bed, it should heat much faster than a heated bed powered by a DC power supply. Let's see how long it will take to heat up the bed temperature to 110 degrees Celsius. The time of 2 minutes 48 seconds is quite impressive. I also used an IR thermometer to check it, and the temperature is accurate. Okay, let's try some ABS filament. Since we have set up the printer using Cura, we will also try this Prusa slicer. Select Add or Remove Printer, select Artillery FFF, and just like Cura, we only have the X1, so we will still use the X1 profile. Let's print a headphone holder. I will just select Generic ABS and use Default Settings. Generally, it would be quite challenging for a printer without an enclosure to print ABS, but I will also just let it print on the glass bed without applying glue and see how it does. It seems the bed can stick ABS pretty well. I'm printing at 255 degrees Celsius nozzle and 110 degrees Celsius bed. Let's see if the corners will be warped as the print goes on. It's pretty good, apart from a tiny bit of warping at this side, but you may not be able to see that on camera. It seems the Prusa slicer didn't hide the seam by default, and we also turned off the part cooling fan when printing ABS. As expected, this overhanging is not as good as PLA. The print is not too bad, but I think the slicer profile is not tuned that well. Let's print the same model again with Cura, and I will also apply some glue to the bed. Just using any $1 glue stick should be fine. I bought $20 3D printing glue before, and they look nicer as they generally make a thinner layer on the bed, but the results are pretty much the same. It sticks very well, and I can't see any warping. The Z seam is also hidden at this corner, so the surface looks much cleaner than the one sliced from Prusa Slicer. It seems the default profile in Cura is tuned better, but I am sure if I spend some time on the Prusa profile, it should print just as well as the one sliced by Cura. 
Finally, I will print something big. As this printer came with a volcano style hot end, it should be able to handle large diameter nozzles. Let's push it to the limit and try the larger nozzle I have, a 1.2 millimeter. I will print this trash can at one millimeter layer height. I will keep the print speed at 60 millimeters per second and slow it down when printing the skirt. I finally slowed it down to 50% of the original speed, which is around 30 millimeters per second. The extrusion is fine, but I think the Z offset is a little bit too low on this side. After I move it up about 0.2 millimeters, it looks better. I would just leave it overnight and I should get a large trash can when I wake up in the morning. Okay, here it is. It's not perfect, there are some tiny blobs on the surface, but overall the result is pretty good, especially for something this big. You won't see the flaws from a few feet away. I think it's handling this 1.2mm nozzle pretty well. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this printer, starting with the pros. 1. An AC heated bed. Heating up to 110 degrees Celsius takes less than 3 minutes, which is quite impressive. The maximum temperature of this bed can reach 150 degrees Celsius as well. 2. The Titan style direct drive with Volcano hot end, which can handle 1.2 mm nozzle with 1 mm layer height, with pretty good print quality. There are not many printers that can do that out of a stock setup without any upgrades. 3. Smart cable management. The connectors are integrated with the gantry and ribbon cables are used for both the X and Z axis. There are only three cables to connect and the print bed cable is also very durable with a slot to fit on the base. It won't get in the way when the bed moves. 4. No more eccentric nut to turn on the Z axis. It uses springs to push the rubber wheels towards the aluminum extrusions. The Z axis of this printer is working pretty well, and there's no Z bending issue as it's making sure the tension of the wheels is correct. But you still need to adjust the X and Y axis if they are loose. 5. It has fast homing and bed leveling compared to other printers. For the bed leveling sensor, the numbers from the test are not as good as a BL Touch, but the print quality has no difference at all. I will talk more about this in the cons coming next. 6. A smoothly feeding filament holder. I personally like this design as we don't have to print some bearing filament holders to get smoother filament feeding. 7. Using 20 by 60 aluminum extrusions to form a sturdy x-axis and y-axis. This printer also came with higher quality inductive limit switches, which may be one of the reasons why this printer can move faster, while you may just see the mechanical limit switches on other printers. 8. This is a high quality build. Normally, when you open up the base and take a look at the wiring on the power supply and motherboard, many printers just come with bare wires connected to screw terminals. However, this printer uses quality connectors and ferrules everywhere, even in some places most users would never see. But no 3D printer is perfect, so let's talk about the cons. One, the glass bed is fixed. As this machine uses an AC heated bed, for your reference, an AC heated bed looks like this. Since it's fixed or taped on the glass bed, I won't say it's impossible to replace the glass bed, but I expect it would require quite a lot of effort to do that without damaging anything. But this bed should last for years, like the one on my frequently used cr 10 Pro V2. I use a glass bed instead of the stock aluminum print bed. It has been almost two years and it's still in pretty good shape. A better solution may be to fix this AC heated silicone on a plate and then use magnets to attach a PEI spring steel sheet on top as a print surface. Of course, this may increase the price of the printer. 2. The 2.8 inch touchscreen is a little bit small on a big machine like this, so using a 4.3 inch touchscreen would be nicer. I think most users are willing to pay an extra $10 to $15 for that. Three. The bed leveling sensor should be fine as the firmware homing speed and sensor probing speed is much faster than most other printers I've ever used. At this speed, it can still achieve a 0.014 mm accuracy, which is around 7% and a 0.2 layer height. 
only on paper, the accuracy is not as good as the BL Touch, which is 0.005 millimeters. It's still very usable and won't affect the print quality. You won't even notice the difference unless you inspect the prints under a microscope. Four, some icons on the touchscreen menu are a little confusing. For example, the preheat icon shouldn't show up when you are actually printing. I understand this is used to adjust the printing temperature in real time, but just changing it to heat or temperature could be better. The unit should also be changed to percentage instead of millimeters when you need to adjust the flow rate and print speed when printing. For the Z offset setting menu, I was confused by the Z equals zero button as I assumed this button is used to set Z to zero, but it's actually moving Z to the current zero positions for you to adjust, and so changing it to move Z to zero would be better. The save EEPROM button would be better to be just called save, and this would be easier to understand for a 3D printing beginner. For the manual leveling corner menu, the icon does not match the position of the spot, but just rearranging the icons in the screen firmware can easily fix this. Besides that, the menu is quite easy to use and has most of the features you need. Five, it didn't come with X and Y axis belt tensioners. After putting so much effort in building a quality printer, just adding two thumb screws for the users to adjust belt tension should only cost a few dollars. Anyways, I consider all of these to be minor issues. Some can be fixed with a simple firmware update, and for the rest, like the fixed print bed and belt tensioner, I can't see how they can affect the print quality at all. They're just a tiny bit of an inconvenience when you need to perform some sort of maintenance in the future. In conclusion, for a large size 3D printer that costs less than $400 with all these great features and high quality build, this printer is hard to beat. I would consider this as the best large size 3D printer under $400. If you're interested in getting this Artillery Sidewinder X2, I put the link under the description. That's it for this video. If you like this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. My brother and I make a new video every weekend, so check out my channel on Mondays and you'll see something new. See you next week.